basically we had a bit of uh, fun and experience with our SUSE CAS platform. And part of that experience is what we want to try to transport now in, in this session. Um, so before I dig into that, who already had some experience with CASP so far in the room? Oh, that's a lot. So are you running it? Who is running a production? Hands up. Uh, one, okay, the rest is just in proof of concept phases or testing. Okay, so um, what we want to do, if the clicker works. Try again. Sorry. We want to have fun with the technique. Ah, okay. wait, wait, don't touch it. <laughs> so what we are going to do, we are not doing a full introduction about uh, CAS platform. You might know that uh, already and some other sessions are going to more detail, but I will give a quick wrap up what it is. Um, after that, we will talk about um, requirements that should be taken into, into account when you're looking into a solution for CASP or when you want to use it. So what do we have to look at it? Um, then we will discuss a bit about the planning and sizing, um, about the deployment best practices, how we do that in, in our engagements, um, and what you should be careful with, etc. After that, a quick word about testing. And after that, we will talk a bit about the operations. Um, for each of these topics, there are separate sessions, so we don't go into too deep details with all of these. So this is basically a, from the requirements down to the implementation and operation session. And we try to cover basically what's important on all of these stages. So first of all, what's CAS platform? It's strange. Here it shows something completely different. Sorry for that. OK. So I, I, I'm, I'm this slide you have to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, we will not invest a lot of time in this slide because most of you have already seen it just to contextualize that uh, this is the product we are working uh, with and even some of the best practice we are going to share today are valid for other uh, platforms that we are deploying also. We are focusing on our CAS solution, which basically is built of all this stuff. So. What is our CAS platform around and what is it about? Basically, it is the way how we deliver Kubernetes to your infrastructure. We help you with our CAS platform to get Kubernetes deployed, installed, configured, upgraded, and operated later on. So we as SUSE try to make it as easy as possible for you to implement and use it. We deliver the standard upstream Kubernetes, most often at the latest version, because we also want to have some time for testing but we try to be as close as possible um, to the latest upstream version. So at the moment we are delivering 1.10 and I believe we plan for summer for 1.14, something around that. Um, underneath we deliver a reduced operating system, we call that micro OS, which my primary purpose is to run container load. So it is basically a standards less, but it's stripped down um, for security purposes and for easier maintenance. And we have implemented a feature called transactional updates, which allows us to apply updates without interfering with the running processes on the system. Um, as I said, we deliver a simple deployment method. We support the whole stack. So when you run into issues, you can call us. Um, we deliver LDAP and Active Directory integration. So just a quick question. Who is already using, uh, you're the only one with act productive implementation. Did the other ones test Active Directory integration so far? Who is going to go that direction? Who is interested in that feature? Okay, thank you. So the next level is we have some caching registry functionality to make it possible to have um, local images even though we don't need a, a full-blown registry locally. And the caches, caching registry also helps us for air-gapped deployments, 
where the internal servers don't have access to, to the internet. That's also a survey question. Who has served or who in the room has served or other question? Do your servers in your infrastructure have constant internet access? Who has that? A few. So the majority of the other persons, they need an air-gapped deployment, right? Okay, that's basically what we also deliver. So you can implement the whole solution internally without constant internet access. Um, we have um, a SUSE registry in the meantime. That's our distribution point um, for SUSE images. At the moment we deliver not too many there, but that will grow in the future. Um, for the deployment of applications, we have Helm included, which is a functionality that allows us to deploy complete applications that consist out of multiple uh, images and functionalities. Um, for the container environment, we support two runtimes, at the, or we deliver two runtimes. Basically, we deliver Docker as one runtime, and we have a tech preview, uh, which is Cryo, and in the future, we will basically standardize on the Cryo runtime for running containers because that basically removes uh, a lot of code that we don't need from the Docker um, and we don't have trademark issues anymore. That's another topic. And the whole solution is delivered in multiple or with multiple deployment methods. We have a method to deploy it in the public cloud. We have a deployment method for private cloud. We deliver images that you can clone and we deliver the already well-known Autoyust method to install less servers. You can also use that for uh, SUSE CAS. All right, that's more or less what I wanted to say about what is CAS. Any questions so far? No, so well, well done. So when you want to implement CAS in your environment, you have to think about a few requirements that you have to come up with before you can decide where and how do I want to deploy it. So first of all, the question is where in your environment do we want to deploy it? We can do it on physical, bare metal deployments. We can do it in virtual environments. Um, basically, that depends on your current infrastructure and the workload you're going to run there. Then what do you need for it? Basically, you need to buy the hardware and you need to buy a subscription from SUSE that basically includes the whole CAS um, solution and you need a subscription for SLES for additional nodes where you provide some additional uh, infrastructure services like an on-premise registry if you want to have one in addition to the system. Um, if you don't have enough knowledge or experience, um, we have offerings for pre-sales support. So before you buy the solution, basically we have technical contacts that you can talk to that help you design the system in the way you need it and figure out which are the right uh, subscriptions to buy and we also offer post sales support that finally helps you to bring it into production and we deliver both uh, maturity through partners but also through our own um, company. Um, finally, after you have implemented it and it's running, um, you need to have someone that you can call if there is an issue with the system. So SUSE is the one that is selling that as part of the subscription. You get 24 by 7 support. Uh, HA, that's correct. We deliver 24 by 7 support also with the CAS subscription because normally when you run, yeah, if you run a critical workload on it and you have an issue, um, it would be bad if you could not call somebody anytime. So that's why we deliver that as part of it. And we also offer uh, proactive post implementation support through consulting services, either through us or through partners. Um, we are also discussing at the moment, so for SUSE storage, not sure if you, if you heard about that, there we have a SUSE select uh, package that you can buy that helps constantly with proactive support. We are currently in discussion if we also want to do that with uh, CAS in the future. Depends a bit on the feedback we get if that's useful and required for you. Okay. So once we discussed all the general requirements, we have to dig a bit deeper into the use, use case specific requirements. So before you can deploy your solution, you need to know what are you going to run in that cluster later on, because that's the basis for the decision, hardware or virtualized, 
and what size of hardware do you need and how many servers do you need to deploy it, basically. So the first question we normally ask is, what's the number of pods you're going to run? Everybody knows what a pod is. Who needs to, should I, who wants to know what a pod is? Okay, a pod basically is, the, the smallest pod is one container running in your cluster. A pod can consist out of multiple containers that are working toge together. So that's basically the, the rough ID behind it. And the number of pods basically defines the scale you need for your system. If your application needs 10 pods, you need a different set of servers than if you have an application that needs 1,000 pods. So that's basically the, the basic rule. The developers that create the application design that. They define how many pods they are going to have, for which scale, for which use. And they also will come with information, how much memory and CPU do I need for each and every of these pods. Um, and basically the number of pods will then define, and their the resource requirements will define how much hardware memory CPU you need for the worker nodes in your cluster. Further on, we need to define the storage requirements, or we need to know what storage requirements are behind um, the application you're going to run. For example, we have a SAP Data Hub application that SAP delivers. Not sure if you had heard about that, but there were other sessions on that. And this application requires dynamic provisioned block storage, dynamic provisioned file storage, and it requires S3-based storage. So from the application that you're going to run there, we need to know that information so that we can set up the system properly with the storage requirements that the application will have. Um, sometimes there are specific hardware requirements. For, for example, um, in the keynote today, you saw the gaming platform thing. And in such a gaming platform, you need support for GPUs in the servers. So if we have such requirements, we need to know them, if there are special hardware requirements or fiber channel connectivity or whatever. And we need to know what the application design is regarding network connectivity. So how many network entry points do I need? Do I need load balancers in front of them? Um, what routing do I need? What firewall setups do I need? These are the things basically the application guy needs to tell us. The next step is maybe you have security requirements, one or the other. Um, when we are talking about security, Basically, every image and container that you're running can be a Trojan horse. And that's something you need to take into account when you're taking any application from somewhere outside in the internet and run it in your internal cluster. It can be a Trojan horse, and we need to think about how do we take care of the, about the security there. So these are basically the requirements you have to specify. What are your requirements regarding security? The next thing is running multiple applications in the same cluster might have some isolation challenges um, that can also be from a GDPR or, or a legal point of view be a problem where some data must not be stored on a system that's accessible by a, an up, another application running in the same cluster, for example. So we need to know if the applications you're going to deploy in the cluster have isolation requirements or not. That basically defines which applications you can have a shared cluster for or where you need to have multiple clusters for. In the worst case, you might need one cluster per application. Can also happen. Yeah, integration into existing identity sources, Active Directory or any LDAP servers, if you have such requirements, we need to know that. And finally, whatever you deploy and use in production, you might need to know or you might have to define recovery time and recovery point objectives that basically say how much availability do you want to have? Do you want to have a single data center deployment? Do you need multiple data center deployment? What are the requirements around that? So um, these are the, the specific requirements. And after you went through these, one of the most important things I didn't cover so far is you need to know what, how much budget can I invest here? because that influences what you can buy finally. And there is the topic about politics, religion, philosophics. Um, pretty often you have internal discussions going on, especially when it, the whole solution is basically meant for DevOps scenarios. 
And sometimes we have to talk to storage guys, sometimes we have to talk to server guys, sometimes we have to talk to whomever in the company, and they might have different views on how we do firewall integration or load balance or storage integration, et cetera. So also these scenarios need to be taken into account when you want to deploy such a solution. Okay, and that's, sorry for the technique here. Try again. Once more. Okay. One more. Once we know the requirements, the next step is to do the planning and sizing. The whole architecture is, yeah, first of all, more than one server. So we need, at the moment, we need an admin server that hosts the internal functionality for the deployment and that hosts the internal identity store that we use via LDAP. Um, then, we need to define how many masters we need for the system. Basically, that's the intelligence of the Kubernetes cluster. For fault tolerance, we always deploy three or more. And we always deploy an odd number due to the maturity decision that the failover is based on. Um, so basically, we always start with three masters. And it depends on your environment um, if we do them physically or virtual. If we do them physically, it would be important to place the three in different data centers, basically, or in different locations. Or you host them on a virtual environment. It depends on your requirements. Um, the more pods you have in your environment, so the, you always start with three masters, but the more pods and the more applications you have running in the cluster, the more load you will have on the masters. So basically, you have to monitor the load on the masters, and after a specific point, you have to add more masters to adjust that based on your load. So this is a thing that grows over time. Um, all the applications that you're going to deploy will not run on the masters. The applications will run on the worker nodes. At the moment, also here, we, we basically start always with three workers. So that when, when we have an application, normally every application is, should have every pod scheduled twice, which means in a normal operation mode, I have a single pod running on one worker and also a second worker. And I need the third one to be able to survive one failure, which means if I, have, if I lose the worker one and I want to have a failover, I need one additional worker that can take over the load. And that's basically the reason why we also always start with three workers. We don't start with lower numbers because we cannot achieve the fault tolerance requirements then. Um, each worker basically can host up to 100 pods. But as I said already, each pod has a specific CPU and memory requirement. And based on that, you might not be able to buy a server big enough to host 100 nodes, uh, 100 pods. Sorry. So the more pods you have and the more resources they need, the more workers you need. Um, regarding fault tolerance, you always have to keep in mind that one of anything is not fault tolerant. So to make something fault tolerant, we have to have it at least twice. This is true for network connectivity, storage connectivity. This is also true for clusters. Basically, if I have only one cluster, this one, and this cluster fails because an administrator typed the wrong command, we are out of business. So if we want to have higher availability, we might need to have a second cluster for fault tolerance and disaster recovery. Um, a few details. In general, for all the masters and workers, we use 50 gigabyte for the operating system disk and we use BetterFS. And because the majority of the data on these machines will be Docker images later on, or container images, we should not say Docker, um, container images, uh, we need varlib Docker on a separate file system and that should be extendable or it should be very big. I have seen 
for example, the SAP Data Hub image had one Im image had 6.5 gigabyte in size. And if you constantly update, you might have multiple versions. And that causes the Valib Docker to run out of space depending on the application changes you have pretty soon. So that's why we come up with the, with the very large size. If you have an extendable system like in VMware, you can also start smaller. But then you have to monitor it and increase it. Or you always have to monitor it anyway. So it really depends on the number of images and what you're running in the system. Um, but we have seen that lower, lower sizes were running out of, spi out of space quickly. OK, deployment best practices. Um, ah, that somehow it doesn't go back. Yes, so there is no infrastructure node on this picture. So I'll come to that topic a bit later. Okay. Um, but basically, everything you deploy in an infrastructure needs some services from outside, like name resolution, time synchronization, and we also need a sort of registry outside of the system, basically. And yeah, how that's going to be deployed, uh, we'll talk a bit about that later. So Kubernetes basically is a, is a big challenge, especially for, uh, I call that legacy customers or traditional IT operations departments, because like OpenStack, Kubernetes is automating a huge portion of the stuff that's going on in the infrastructure. For example, it's doing fully automated storage provisioning. That means it creates a logical unit in the storage, if I want that, and set it up presents that logical unit to my application. In traditional in infrastructures, that's done by the storage operators. If I'm doing Kubernetes, basically Kubernetes is taking over the job that they have been doing for ages. That's a political challenge. So that's one of the parts um, you have to think about, and the term everybody talks about is DevOps here. Um, at the moment, most of the companies are organized in silos. We have one storage, one server, one network silo. When we're going to deploy Kubernetes and integrate that in the infrastructure, basically we have to bring these silos horizontally together. And that's one of the things that I learned is one of the biggest challenges in the beginning because you have to talk to everybody. And not everybody is really open to accept a piece of software adjusting configurations that they have done through long-term processes for ages. So that's the, the thing with the uh, storage automation. That's the same thing with the network automation. For example, automated integration of load balancer settings. Um, basically, the, the application that delivers that's delivered is able to change load balancer settings if they need it. And you have to make, it sure, make sure that the network is integrated properly to allow that. So that's why I have this slide. Basically, you have to think about the DevOps discussion in your environment before you can use Kubernetes in the way how it's meant. Um, OK. Um, deployment. So when I go to the deployment, I will go through five steps. I will cover that separately now. So first of all, I do the infrastructure preparation. Um, depending on what you have bought, what hardware you have bought, what application you want to run there, we always review before we implement once more to ensure what you've bought fits to your requirements. Then we do the hardware setup if you have hardware. Uh, we do some BIOS settings, adjust firmware settings, standardize that because in a big cluster, you want to make sure that all of the servers are as identical as possible and have standardized setups. Um, we al always disable all the hardware things that we don't need, parallel ports, serial ports, whatever. Uh, we set up the correct date and time. In VMware environments, I highly recommend to use para-virtualized SCSI connectivity. I'm not sure if, if you know what that is. So please do not use the normal full emulated SCSI controller. Use the um, Paravirtualized that reduces the latency for the IOs and you get many more IOPS and that helps a lot 
um, when you're running a lot of pods that have small IOs, basically. Um, we make sure that we have time synchronization. Also for Kubernetes and this cluster, it's required that all the systems in the cluster have a proper time sync. Also the time synchronization has to be fault tolerant, so you should have at least three time sources that are independent of each other. Um, name resolution. Never ever install a server without the proper DNS entries. Make sure that each and every IP address is resolvable forward and backward, and each IP address gets a unique name. So we don't want to have DNS round robin for a single server, for example. Um, and obviously, DNS also has to be fault tolerant. Uh, make sure that Etsy hostname points to the primary name of the server. That's also a general rule, not only valid for cast. And at that stage, we also create some DNS entries that we later on use for the deployment. We need one DNS entry for the Kubernetes API that later on points to a load balancer IP address, a virtual IP. And um, yeah, obviously, we, we can temporarily work with a C name, but that will not be fault tolerant. So we, for the whole deployment later on, you must have a load balancer in front of the Kubernetes cluster. Without a load balancer, you don't have fault tolerance for the masters. <sighs> this thing is crazy. Okay, this is your question. The majority, the major delivery of applications to a Kubernetes cluster is going through a registry. We have a lot of registries out there in the internet, but as you already mentioned, or I asked you, your servers can't reach the internet for security reasons or whatever. So basically you need an on-premise registry where you can put in all the images that you need and you want to run for your application later on within your cluster. Um, what we deliver is the normal Docker distribution registry. This is open source, but unfortunately it does not have authentication and authorization included. So we as SUSE deliver Portus, which is an add-on to the registry, where you can create users uh, and teams, and where you can control who can access what, who can write which image in which namespace on the registry, and who can read what from that registry. So basically it's the security around the registry. Um, we create a DNS entry, that's simple. Um, we create some namespaces. Basically the, the whole purpose of this exercise is someone needs to fetch an image from somewhere, needs to inspect that image, figure out if the image has valid content and is secure or is coming from a trusted source. Then this image gets to the registry internally. So I can do that basically on any Docker machine where I can reach the internet, I inspect the image, I put it in this registry, and later on I can give my cluster a specific user that's allowed to retrieve an image from a specific namespace out of the registry. And this way I can control which image can be used in which cluster. And that's possible with this on-premise registry. Does that answer your question now? Okay. Uh, it's also possible to integrate our portals with LDAP or Active Directory, just as a side note. Okay, and then basically all the images that you need in your environment need to be put in here. We as SUSE deliver two tools to help you with that. We have a tool that's called Scopeo that allows you to copy images from A to B. And we have a tool to create Helm mirrors. Um, basically Helm is... Uh, do we have a slide about Helm? No, we don't. Okay, we have a tool that can clone Helm repositories from the, from basically from SUSE, but in the future also from other sources to on-premise, and there you can then uh, provide your own Helm charts for the applications you're going to deploy later on in your clusters. Okay, optional, you can set up some caching registries. Basically, these are um, HTTP proxies for SSL content. So just in case you have a bigger environment where you have one central registry and you don't want to deploy um, several remote registries in addition and clone all the stuff, we can have some caching functionality in the middle. 
Okay, next step is you have to prepare your load balancers. Um, we need for the API endpoint and for the authentication within Kubernetes, we need these two ports being provided through a virtual IP on the load balancer and then connected to the three masters. Um, we need to set up the storage that you need for your environment. So basically, if you want to have a Ceph storage underneath, you need to prepare that before you can integrate Kubernetes. I think that's logical. Um, I mentioned the Helm chart repository a minute ago. You have to do, well, I already mentioned that. Oh, and one of the most important things is, one rule is that everything that we are going to deploy in the cluster needs to be reproducible. And that means the majority of things we deploy in the cluster are coming either from Helm charts or from th simple YAML files or LD files if I do it into the LDAP server. And we highly recommend to have a staging and a central Git or something like that, a source code management system where you store and version, do a version control on these things that you're going to deploy into the cluster to ensure that whatever you do can be done again if you delete the cluster, for example, later on by accident. Or if you delete something out of the cluster or something breaks, basically the target is I can get to the same point where I am at the moment by just running through the whole deployment process that I have in the Git. Okay, for the server installation, uh, we need to prepare some software staging. So maybe you already have a SUSE manager in your environment or an SMT server. That's what we're using for CASP also. Basically, we need that for staging patches to ensure if I have a five node cluster or seven node clusters to cluster today on a specific patch level, if I want to add another node tomorrow, I want to install that with exactly the same patch level that all the other servers have so far. And because SUSE releases new patches on a daily basis, these servers should not get the patches from SUSE direct. They should get them from your internal staging system that can be SUSE manager, uh, subscription management toolkit, or limited the, the RMT uh, we deliver with Leaf 15 these days. Um, better if I already mentioned. Normally we disable firewall up armor IPv6. Anybody on IPv6 already? No. Oh, you. Okay, we have to talk later. <laughs> Interested in that. Um, for the deployment, as I said, we have an image-based approach and we have Autoyust. As consultant, I always recommend to go the Autoyust way and not use the image because when you use the image, you have to clone it, you have to personalize it, and then you have to patch it to the same stage that all other servers have. The time needed for the patching most often it's the same time like installing from scratch with Autoyust. And Autoyust gives you much more flexibility in customization than the image-based approach. That's why we use Autoyust. And this way we can guarantee that all the servers are always installed identical. Uh, there is a consulting solution available to make the installation with Autoyust a bit easier. So just have a look at that Git repository if you want. Oh, by the way, the slides will be provided after SUSECon for download. So if you don't have to write that links down. And after the whole deployment of the servers, so we deploy the admin and all the masters and workers, um, we have to do some config changes sometimes. For example, for Ceph integration, I need to copy the Ceph conf or whatever. Um, today, it's not easy with CASP to use um, SUSE Manager or something else for config management because CASP itself has salt integrated and there can only be one salt master and that's on the admin server here. So that's why I have a question mark here. Today, basically only file copy or manual changes are available. In the future, this is going to change with version four. Okay. After I have deployed everything, oh yeah, one important point we don't like DHCP for servers. So even though with the earlier versions of CASP that was possible, you could use DHCP for the servers, we highly recommend to use static IP configs to make that more stable and more reliable. 
And I believe in the future we will not even support the dynamic IP addresses anymore. Uh, we verify time synchronization, verify name resolution. We test all the network connectivity, especially in hardware environments. We verify if each network card is in the correct VLAN, if bonding works, etc. And then we have a few steps after the server installation to get our Kubernetes up and running. So on the admin server, we get into the VLOOM web interface. There we can say, okay, I accept all the salt minions that registered, the masters and workers. And then I can select which of the servers should be a master and which should be a worker. And finally, I give it some configuration options like uh, what's the DNS name for the API, for the VIP, I configured on the load balancer, you might remember. Uh, what's the DNS entry for VLOOM? Basically, these entries are later used for the SSL certificates that are created as subject alternative names. And everything that you do there during this deployment phase cannot be changed later on. At least that, that, that's the current status. So you have to think very good about what you're entering there. There are some workarounds, some things we can change, but generally think about the current status is whatever you enter is static and cannot be changed. Um, we enable Tiller. Basically, that's the functionality Helm uses to deploy applications later in the cluster. And we configure the overlay network settings. Overlay network is an internal cluster communication protocol that you basically can't reach from external, and that's used for application internal communication. So if something runs on worker one, wants to talk to worker two, it's through an overlay network that works similar like a VPN. It's tunneled, basically. Is that flannel? Yes. So at the moment, it's flannel. Future will be CNI, I believe. Cilium. 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 Yeah, OK. So um, yeah, we are using flannel at the moment. We are using Cilium is the future. Future is Cilium. At the moment, we are using Flannel. Um, the most important thing here is, during the configuration, you have to specify the IP address range for this overlay network. The default is a 172 something network. Please make sure that this network that you specify there is not used anywhere else in your infrastructure, especially not for something where you have services running the application in this cluster might want to talk to. So, for example, if you have a Ceph cluster in the same range that the overland network has, the cluster will never be able to talk to the Ceph cluster. So, this is very important. Make sure to use IP address ranges there that are not used in areas where you want to have services that this cluster is going to talk to later on. All right. And after you have given all the parameters, you click on the final bootstrap button and go and get a, to have a cup of coffee and you start praying, hoping. You see a circling thing and when you come back, everything will be green. If not, it's nice to have Autoyast and start from scratch. Basically, that's one of the challenges we face from time to time. It's much better now, but we still have some challenges. So if Initially, something was not implemented correct, or if you have some false connectivities, network setup wrong, whatever, name resolution not set up properly, the bootstrapping fails from time to time, and then you have to start from scratch. Oh, this time was different. One click and everything went through. <laughs> Where are we? Deployment. Yeah. OK, this was the deployment. So after the step four and we have done the bootstrapping, basically you, you have a fully running Kubernetes cluster. And with that Kubernetes cluster, you can do everything that Kubernetes can do for you. That's the status at that point in time. So the normal thing, what we do normally then is we create some namespaces so that you can have different um, areas to deploy applications or different security uh, settings for these. We create some users and groups to control who can do what in the cluster. Or we hook it up to Active Directory or any, any other LDAP directory. 
Uh, we create roles, role assignments. Basically, we do the, the configuration of Kubernetes internals for security. And we deploy some additional basic services, like we have to do some storage setup. For example, if we want to have dynamic provision file storage, we can set up the NFS or CephFS provisioner or the block storage provisioner or VMware provisioner, whatever you need in your environment. Um, we can implement the Kubernetes dashboard, which gives you a bit of a graphical view uh, what's going on. We have ingress, we deploy monitoring, whatever. So whatever applications you need within your cluster, this is the point where we are starting the deployment. Uh, partially for the Kubernetes related services and then in the next step, whatever application you want to run in that system. Um, some applications will come directly from, for example, your Jenkins system that directly can talk to Kubernetes. Some others will come through Helm, some others will come through command line actions. I don't know. That really depends on what you're going to do with the system later on. Okay, and finally, after we have done the implementation, I give you the message that no cluster on earth works if you did not prove or work, doesn't work in the way how you expected that it works if you did not prove it through testing. So whenever you implement a cluster, I highly recommend to test and document the tests after the implementation. So how do we do that? <laughs> Sorry. We need a different clicker or a different laptop. <laughs> um, so first of all, before we do any testing, we create a, cre a written test plan. Basically, that what that means is, I, for, for, from my requirements, I already know what I have to test. For example, you know I want to have a data center failover functionality. Based on this requirement, I know that I need to have a test case that verifies that. So I'm writing down in my test case the starting point. For example, application is running in both data centers. We have 100 users connected. They are doing this and that, whatever. And I have this and that load. And then I write down what I want to test. Power off data center one. And then I write down what, what is my expected result. My expected result is everything goes down on one side, the application fails over within 50 seconds or whatever, and no user will realize that a failover was there. So that's my expectation. I do that for several test cases. I write it down, I think about it, I write the expectation there, and then I go and execute these tests, one after the other. And during these tests, I prepare the starting point, I execute the test, and I document each and every thing that I do there. I also document the timestamps, for example, so that I can find out how long did the failover take, when I did that up, press the power off. I document the test results, and after that, I compare the results with my expectation. And sometimes I have to correct my expectation, because I was just assuming wrong. Sometimes I have to fix the system or the design or the implementation to reach my requirements. But without doing this, basically I cannot make sure that the cluster behaves exactly the way how I want to have it. So especially in support, we, hear, we heard regular the situation that after a node failed, the application did not behave in the way how I expected it to behave if a node fails. And we as support have then to dig into that and figure out what's going wrong there. And normally I would expect that you can provide me exactly that, where you tested that successfully after the implementation. And that's why we have to do all of that. And finally, a single positive might not be the standard. So some tests need to be repeated multiple times. So basically, this is also what we do in QA, more or less, I hope. I'm not working in QA, but I, that's my expectation for our QA also, but we cannot test your application and your deployment. 
Okay. Fault tolerance, I think I mentioned that already. We introduced the failures um, that we built the system for. So if I have a dual NIC configuration, I test failure of one NIC, I test the failure of the other NIC, and I test also, also failure of both NICs because I want to make sure that Kubernetes realizes the node is out and does a failover, for example. So all the failures that I plan my system for are the ones I introduce also in my testing. Okay, I don't have the slide with the performance testing. If you have a performance relevant application, these tests should also be added and you have to do performance testing depending on the application you're running there. Okay, and with that, you still yeah. have 15 minutes to go. Okay, um, the minutes. I was not so slow. <laughs> no, no, that's really good. We, we hope that I was not going to talk because uh, Martin was going to consume all the time, but finally we <laughs> have some minutes to, to go back and talk about operations. So what you see here and what Martin has described basically is what we are, the model we are following the customers, okay? And they're really the best practice to have the, cast, uh, the cluster up and running. So that's usually when our work finishes. As a consultants, we leave, okay? And we leave the customer with the operational staff. So, from a product perspective, all our work is already done. Cast is deployed, everything is set, and, and the customer is ready to uh, have your workloads deployed. But there is another point we wanted uh, to include in the presentation, which related to operation. Which day two, I have my cluster uh, running. What should I do? What uh, to 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 guarantee that everything runs uh, healthy? that I'm able to understand what's happening around, especially on those customers that are starting to play with uh, Kubernetes environments. Okay, so first thing I will should uh, address as an operational model is how I'm going to handle the life management, uh, life cycle. So I have my brand new cluster, but that cluster will need, as Martin said, we are going to receive daily patches uh, from SUSE and we need to be sure that all that process is well known by our, our uh, customer because it's not the first time that we leave a cluster up and running and next day they have to apply an update. They call us because they, everything was destroyed. So important is to review how this life cycle works and how they have de uh, to deploy uh, and update their, their environment. So, Important, make sure that the uh, staging environment that we talk during the deployment keeps being in place and is constantly updated, especially when the customer is working on our gap environment, those environments that do not have internet connection. We need to make sure that this uh, environment is updated from time to time and that each update const, uh, remains uh, stable during uh, the patching of all the nodes in the cluster. Our uh, update model is called something transactional updates. Those transactional updates, uh, once uh, uh, the, our operator uh, looks to our dashboard and they see that there is an update and they click on apply, okay, the process is going to take care of uh, modifying and patching the nodes one by one. So basically all the operations that you will have to do manually on the way. So it takes, uh, starts with your worker nodes. Basically, they cord on the nodes, so no new workloads are deployed there. Once the, those nodes uh, are cord on and all the workload is stopped and the node is stopped, and all the updates are applied. So we, rep we repeat that process on all the nodes, uh, and that's uh, managed automatically by the Belun, our uh, uh, management dashboard. So basically we need to wait until all the nodes are green again and the customer need to understand that that process can take some time. So there are a lot of nodes that need to be uh, updated and all the salt orchestration we have behind the scene is going to take care of that but they need to uh, wait until everything has finished. Okay. So there are also some recommendations as part of the transactional update, the process is going to take care of stopping the workload. There is some important part is uh, operators must understand if they have what they call single pod application, application where they only have one replica running in the cluster. In that case, 
it's not really a best practice, but it's a reality. We have customers that are running that kind of workloads. In that case, it's important that they ha keep an eye on their, those applications, and even they can do some manual movements if really needed. Okay? And all this process is really managed uh, from the Wellum, the Wellum user interface, so they, you don't have to go server by server doing any kind of uh, local uh, operation on those machines. Monitoring and logging. This is uh, another important part uh, that uh, what we are going to <coughs> describe here is not covered by the product, okay? But what we do include is all the documentation on uh, the instruction on how to deploy all the tools you are going to need to uh, manage monitor and logging. To deal with these activities, basically you can count on with the uh, standard uh, monitoring uh, features that come with Kubernetes and etcd. You have on the command line, on the client uh, APIs, you have access to health information and status information from the cluster, that's at, at the very low level. In the past, uh, we included Hipster, which is uh, a, a module that was capturing uh, runtime information about your cluster, okay, that was, that information was being pushed to InfluxDB to be consume that information from Grafana dashboard. We have uh, updated that process, so basically we keep uh, using the standard C advisor Docker level monitoring, but now we have moved to an approach where we focus on, uh, an, on a more standard approach that you will find here with the CAS platform, but also in other projects. Uh, like uh, OpenStack with Monasca, uh, SUS Enterprise Storage, where basically we are using Prometheus and Grafana on all of them. In the future, that will be also the technology for monitoring that we, you will find on, on SUSE Manager. Alert Manager. Basically, it comes uh, side by side with Prometheus, and it's the way you can define which are the elements that you uh, uh, generate your alarms. For example, we were talking about the stuff like this space as one of the critical points in, in our monitoring because at some point in time we do not control how many copies, how many new versions of the, of the images are going to be deployed by our, our end users. So it's quite typical in the cluster. This is the most typical uh, incident we find that they run out of space in some of the nodes and it's the, the, the typical element where we should define alert, okay? Going to the logs, uh, Kubernetes uh, uh, has a lot of internal elements plus uh, all the elements we are uh, adding to the product to build the, the full platform. So there is a lot of places where we, just, we can go and gather information about uh, issues that we may find in the cluster. So. The main uh, log location you will find are the admin node. In the admin node, you will have all the logs related to the Bellum, our uh, management dashboard. They will, they will be there. And also, you will find there all the logs related to authentication. Okay? The authentication is managed by a local LDAP uh, container that is running on the admin node. So if you want to uh, have a clue of uh, what is happening around the authentication, you should go there. That information about authentication can be combined later on with our own uh, the Kubernetes audit log, where in, in the admin node we know who has been logging into the system, and in the audit log we can track the different operations that happen in the cluster. That's really important to understand who did what and to be able to go back and track uh, possible issues in the cluster. One? Yeah? Five. Five, okay. So, Salt right now is uh, the key component uh, behind Bellum that is managing all the orchestration on the management on the cluster. So there we will find three main logs. Okay, the Salt orchestration, the Salt orchestration log uh, is the one that explains what is happening. For example, when we update our cluster, there you will find a clue of how the start uh, update processes started, which were the nodes in which order. That is covered by the Salt orchestrator. And then uh, Salt has this uh, notion of, of master and minion. Each of our uh, nodes is a minion. So uh, minion level information can be uh, recovered on the nodes. And we also have information about uh, the Salt master. This is basically what you have uh, at the traditional level. But uh, 
our recommendation is that you set up some kind of external monitoring platform, okay? And you will find also information about that in the, uh, in the documentation, which uh, basically consists of uh, a FluentD agent that are running on the node that is pushing, pushing the uh, information to an elastic share stats where we can really have a single pane of glass to control all the login information because otherwise, it can be quite difficult to understand, especially on bigger clusters, uh, what is happening without being able to search and identify uh, and be able to correlate information coming from, from different, different logs. And the later point is important that our customers and of you as possible customer understand that you should leverage also those that approach when you are designing your application. So you should uh, include uh, application specific monitoring. Okay. And that part is uh, quite funny. Bas basically, you, we should <laughs> stop here, okay? <laughs> because. Uh, we are working with infrastructure. It's the same, for example, when we are open, uh, talking about OpenStack. It's quite difficult when you are setting up uh, a foundation that is meant to uh, run workloads uh, on top of that, that we are able to re fully recover in a consistent state the full uh, environment. That's something that is really difficult. And that's why you, we are following an approach where uh, we get to a point when that's not really needed. Okay. We have several strategies uh, that we can follow, okay? This is basically uh, the best practice that has to be defined. For example, every uh, thing we deploy has to be reproducible. It's what Martin was talking about, the importance of keeping track of my deployment in a version control system. So I have a place where I can go back and reproduce any deployment I have already done. Having a second cluster is especially important. If I really want to deal with a disaster recovery, uh, the only possibility to have a quick recovery is uh, having the guarantee that I have a second cluster where I can, uh, my, my workloads uh, keep running. The application backup is uh, really the one uh, that has the responsibility about consistency. We, we will, in the, later, in the next slide, we will see some more details about what we can do from the cluster level. Two minutes. Two minutes, okay. But it's important to understand that a given application, for example, if we have some kind of uh, mailbox management application where our, each mailbox for our user is a pod in our application, if messages are being sent, if for any reason the cluster is stopped or is destroyed, that state is not able to be recovered by us from the infrastructure point of view. So it's the application, the one that has to uh, has its own way to uh, keep consistency uh, during the backup and the recovery process. And I will go back fast. Just for you to understand that uh, those are the generic recommendations and uh, as if as customer you want a full list of what you have to back up, these are the items you should cover as part of your, of your backup strategy, okay? And I finish now so I will have w one minute, okay? Well, for, still, for still, question. still 60 seconds left, so 60 take seconds. your time. So, <laughs> basically, if you have uh, any question about the process we have described, it's you have one minute. <laughs> yeah, the next ones are not yet waiting there, so we, we, we might be able to cover one or two or even more questions. Any questions for the whole story we told you now? Okay, then I would say, oh, one last, I have a question. Could you please make sure that when you get the request for the survey about this session to fill it out? We don't have any prizes, but we're really looking forward to get your feedback, especially recommendations how we can do better in the future. We really want to learn and come another time again. And with that, yeah, thank you for being here and listening thank to you. us. <laughs>